these time scales intersect at a mass of around 8 solar mass. And the masses above this uh, 8 solar mass is defined as the high mass domain and below which is the low mass domain. Now, as you can see in this plot, for low mass stars, the kelvin helmholtz time scale is greater than the accretion time scale, which means that the uh, accretion to this protostar is over before the hydrogen burning or the nuclear fusion ensues at the core of the star. But when you come to the high mass domain, the kelvin helmholtz time scale is lesser than the accretion time scale, which implies that the uh, uh, nuclear fusion ensues at the core, even while the star is still accreting matter. Now, as a result of this, the uh, radiation pressure from the star uh, uh, hinders the uh, uh, or it uh, it uh, hinders the infalling matter onto the central star, and this poses a limit on the maximum mass a star can attain. Now, we can see we can try to look if uh, uh, the this problem can be uh, addressed by introducing or by considering high. Uh, larger uh, accretion rates. For example, in this plot, if we consider a larger mass accretion rate of the order of 20 to minus 4 solar mass per year, which is this uh, red line here, we see that the Kelvin Helmholtz time scale and the accretion time scale, they intersect at around just about, about 10 solar mass. And even a higher accretion rate of 20 to minus 3 solar mass per year, these uh, lines intersect at around 20 solar mass. So as it can be seen, the radiation pressure problem pertains even if we consider high accretion rate. Now, the other problem we discussed is the fragmentation problem. Now, this is uh, related to the large size scales in which the massive stars form. As we know, the massive stars form in um, uh, very large uh, clumps. But theoretically, uh, any density fluctuations within these clumps, would, these massive clumps, would lead to a cascading fragmentation, which would render these uh, smaller clumps uh, unable to uh, form massive stars. So these are the two theoretical limitations to understanding uh, high mass star formation. But however, even in spite of these, there are observational evidences for the presence of, uh, of uh, very high mass stars of the order of around uh, 100 solar mass. So to explain this and to uh, overcome these uh, theoretical limitations, several theoretical models have been proposed over the years. And three of the main major, major models are the monolithic collapse, competitive accretion, and collision submerges. Now, these three models implore very different initial conditions on the uh, parental cloud. In the case of monolithic collapse, the mass is gathered before star formation. And this model is essentially a scaled up version of low mass star formation, where the um, protostar accretes matter from the envelope uh, through a circumstellar disk. Uh, at a larger accretion rate of the order of around 10 to minus 3 solar mass per year. And the radiation from the uh, forming star escapes through the cavities created by the jets and outflows. So this model adequately circumvents the radiation pressure problem, but it still leaves the fragmentation problem open. Now here is where the competitive accretion model comes into picture, and which is this, and this model uh, actually favors fragmentation. According to this model, a large molecular cloud uh, fragments into several clumps, and all of these clumps have the potential to form high mass stars based on their position in the cluster. Now, as the name suggests, these clumps they compete with each other to form, uh, I mean, to uh, for, compete with each other for nourishment from the uh, uh, the gas reservoir. Now, in this case, the high, the ma most massive star has the tendency to form at the center of the cluster where the gravitational potential is the maximum. Now, the third model is the collision submergers model, where in which case the mass is gathered after the star formation. So according to this model, the star formation or the protostars form via the low mass star formation mechanism. But once they, when these low mass stars, then they uh, merge with each other to form massive stars. But in uh, but the this model would require high protostellar densities, very high protostellar densities, so, so that this model is like more or less dismissed now. So uh, although these um, theoretical models have been able to uh, uh, address, like uh, explain several aspects of uh, uh, pertaining to high mass star formation, a universal theory elucidating the 
form, star formation mechanism over the entire mass range is still not established. The deficiency of adequate observational support has uh, hindered the uh, efforts to constrain these models. So this brings us to the observational challenges in and in, 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 in encountered in building a proper observational database. So the observational investigation of the formation of high mass stars, especially the very early stages, is quite challenging because one, high mass stars are short lived, and two, uh, they spend most of their life uh, protostellar lifetime in an embedded phase, which results in high extinction. And owing to the short lifespans of these massive stars, they are rare in comparison to uh, the low mass counterparts. And as a consequence of this rarity, they, the statistical distribution of high mass stars places them at very large distances from the sun of their order of a few kiloparsecs. In addition to these, uh, it is seen that high mass stars often form in clustered environments, which leads to confusion. Now, this and the large distances of the uh, high mass stars would call for high angular resolution observations uh, uh, to, to, to understand the intricacies involved in their formation. You know, despite these, uh, recent years have seen growing evidence for star and cluster formation uh, triggered by cloud flow collision. Now, it is also proposed as a viable mechanism for the formation of high, high mass stars. The, the, so let us look at the theoretical aspects of the uh, uh, of the cloud flow collision event. So this uh, so these authors uh, carried out the, the hydrodynamic simulation uh, for a simple cloud collision event, and the schematic of which is shown here. So when two clouds collide, a compressed layer is formed at the interface of these two clouds, and this uh, uh, this uh, short compressed layer is highly dense and it becomes the birth size of self-gravitating cores. So this is just the basic uh, understanding of cloud collision. Now plugging in the magnetic field information, uh, the Inno and Foucault in 2013 carried out the magnetohydrodynamic simulations. And according to this uh, model, the supersonic collisions between the uh, clouds would boost the magnetic field strength and the Gans density in the uh, shock compressed layer. Now the uh, shock compressed layer then collapses into dense filaments where the magnetic field is amplified in the di direction perpendicular to the filaments. Now from these theoretical aspects of uh, cloud flow collision, uh, certain observational signatures have been used to identify the cloud flow collision candidates. So these are the three major observational sig signatures. First one is the complementary distributions with displacement, which basically means that the spatial distribution of the colliding clouds will be complementary to each other. So morphologically, we'll be able to see the uh, the uh, uh, an arc-like structure in in the collision. I mean, cloud collision candidates. And the kinematic signature. The second one is the kinematic signature, uh, wherein we see the presence of a bridging feature, uh, like. Here in this plot, if you see, there is a bridging feature uh, with an intermediate velocity between the two uh, between the two clouds. So this uh, bridging feature arises from the shock compressed layer. And the, the next uh, uh, feature is uh, finally we'll see a U-shaped uh, uh, morphology in the final phase of the collision. Now, uh, from a recent review by Fuku et al. in 2020, it is it was found that. Only a little more than 50 cloud flow collision candidates have been detected where the collision, uh, uh, the collision events triggers the formation of one or more high mass stars or a massive cluster. So in my work, so I'll come to the, um, the work which I did for the, uh, my last work which I did for PhD. So in this work, uh, I started off by looking at a, uh, Planck galactic hole clump G133.50, which is also associated with a, uh, a young protocluster. So from literature, we found that uh, this, uh, this is a cluster of ISOs, and, uh, and we see there's an interesting morphology for this complex G133, and it prompted us to look into the cloud collision aspect of this source. So for this, we made use of the 12 CO and 13 CO line observations uh, from the archives of the Purple Mount Observatory. So what we did was um, 
uh, we constructed the integrated intensity maps or the moment zero maps uh, for uh, these lines at three different velocity ranges. So the first one here is uh, in the first velocity range, we see that the cloud complex has an elongated morphology. And in the third uh, velocity range, it has like a boomerang like uh, structure with a cavity opening towards the northeast. Now, if you see the intermediate velocity range, it has a very interesting morphology that it has like an arc like structure. And uh, which is similar to the uh, an arc like structure which we see in the shock compressed layers according to the theoretical models. So, to uh, yeah, I you know at this, um, um, yeah, so to wait a minute, yeah. So what we did was we extracted the spectra of these uh, 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 the this cloud complex at these three uh, these three velocity ranges like samples these three velocity ranges, and as can be seen uh, the spectra extra extracted towards this uh, velocity range uh, peaks at around sixteen minus sixteen point nine kilometer per second, and for this cloud it has a single peak at around minus fourteen point one kilometer per second. And interestingly, in the intermediate velocity range, we see contribution from both the uh, from both the uh, velocity components. So uh, now, so this actually gives a morphological resemblance to a cloud pollution scenario, where we see two entirely two different uh, cloud uh, cloud components, uh, which have one which where one has an elongated morphology, which we call as G133A, and the other which has a cavity morphology, which we call as G133B. So now before we look into the kinematic signatures of uh, the uh, cloud collision in this cloud complex, we first need to see if these clouds are gravitationally bound or not. So for this, we uh, uh, calculated the total mass of the cloud from the 12 CO and 13 CO uh, maps by constructing the excitation temperature map and the uh, hydrogen column density map following the method described by uh, these authors. And the total mass was of the entire cloud complex was found to be uh, 2.6 to 10 days to 3 solar mass. And we also calculated the virial mass using this equation, which is found to be uh, 5.8 into 10 days to 3 solar mass. And as is quite evident, the virial mass is greater than the total mass of the clouds, which implies that these two clouds are not gravitationally bound. So these are like two independent entities which are physically close together. So now we look into the kinematic signatures of uh, cloud cloud uh, collision. So, so what we do is we need to be looking for, uh, like we said, uh, we need to be looking for bridging features in this in this cloud complex. So this figure here is the uh, two color composite image of the uh, the G133A and G133B cloud cloud uh, clouds in uh, uh, blue and red respectively. So what we do is we construct the position velocity diagrams for these two clouds. So position velocity diagram is basically a uh, uh, slice from the spectral cube along any given direction. So for uh, the 133A, we constructed the PV diagram for 12 CO and 13 CO along this direction A. And for the G133B, we constructed the PV diagram along this cut here, which samples G133B. So the, as can be seen for both the 12 CO and 13 CO lines, the two clouds are connected by very prominent bridging features, like as you can see here and uh, here and here and here. So there are actually like, we can make out four bridging features connecting the two clouds. Such bridging features, like I said, they arise from the turbulent gas within the, uh, uh, the, the shock compressed layer, which has uh, the intermediate velocity. Now that we have established that uh, the, the uh, this, uh, G133 is uh, like it's a, a cloud cloud collision candidate. We need to be looking for how it manifests in the uh, the dust map as well as the uh, temperatures. So in this can so we constructed the uh, excitation temperature and the column density map. Uh, yeah, so we constructed the excitation and column temperature, excitation temperature and column density maps, and that can be seen from this map. 
The short compressed layer at the interacting front manifests as an open arc structure where there is an uh, there's, there's an uh, higher excitation temperature which follows the arc structure of the uh, the the uh, interacting region. And if you look at the column density map as well, there is an enhanced column density in this uh, uh, shock compressed layer, and this could be attributed to the multi-dimensional compression of the shock layer. Now, as now, we have, sorry, if yeah. I missed. So you, how do you get this excitation temperature? You have multiple lines observed. Uh, so yeah, the excitation temperature map is like uh, from the 12 CO. This is the equation we follow from the 12 CO and 13 CO. So this is under the assumption that we have a local thermodynamic equilibrium and the uh, uh, the typically thick 12 CO emission. So no, okay. we don't have multiple lines. Just 12 CO we're using 12 CO and 13 CO. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so yeah, so now as I uh, discussed about the theoretical aspects of cloud pollution, uh, uh, in we would expect to see filament and core formation in the inter intersection region. So to look at these, we uh, made you examine the 850 micron dust map uh, from the uh, um, uh, obtained from the archives of Scuba, and we see that there is a network of filaments uh, in this map which follows the uh, orientation of the open arc structure or the orientation of the uh, shock compressed layer. And within and these filaments, they have localized disk peaks are also seen within these filaments. And using the Fellwalker algorithm, we were able to identify 14 disk cores, uh, uh, in, in, uh, and these are named according to the positions with, with respect to the central uh, core. And we also estimated the masses of these uh, cores using this equation. So uh, in order to see whether these cores have the potential to form high mass stars or not, we plotted the we plotted these cores on the uh, mass radius plot where we can see where is where the low mass star formation region and the high mass star formation region is clearly given. But as you can see, none of the cores uh, fall in the high mass star forming region. But if you look at the surface density threshold, the surface densities of these cores, the, all of them fall. I mean, most of them fall above the surface density threshold uh, for massive stars. Defined as 0 0.05 gram per centimeter square by Urukuha et al. So this suggests that more, uh, the some of the most massive cores can have the potential to form high mass stars. Now, as I mentioned earlier, again, uh, the according to mass magnetohydrodynamical simulations, the magnetic field will be amplified in the direction perpendicular to the filaments during collision. So to get the orientation of the mean orientation of the magnetic field, we you made use of the Planck polarization data, and the mean orientation was um, the magnetic field uh, orientation uh, over the entire cloud complex was found to be interestingly perpendicular, almost perpendicular to the film uh, the filamentary structure. So this is an excellent agreement with the magnetohydrodynamic simulations. So, in as in literature, we have I'm seen sorry. that this. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you have that Planck map here with you? Uh, this Planck map uh, right now, I. Of course, you don't have it. Okay. No, okay. I, it's not there in the presentation. No, but okay. I can uh, show it to you later, maybe. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So, as from literature, we know that this cloud complex is associated with a uh, young protoplaster. But the question here is, was this protocluster formation triggered by the cloud collision event? So to answer this, we inspect the distribution of the <coughs> YSOs in this region using the data retrieved from the uh, made infrared all wise catalog. So uh, over the entire uh, cloud complex. Now for the YSO classification, we constructed the color color diagram with the, uh, the, with the wise bands. And using the color criteria given by Koenig and Elizabeth, uh, we were able to identify around 11 class 1 uh, uh, YSOs and 14 class 2 YSOs. Now, to see if these were, uh, in fact, uh, triggered by the fall, triggered by cloud collision, we overlay them on the, uh, you overlay these YSOs on the uh, column density map. 
So like, as you can be seen, the uh, like most of the uh, detected biosos they fall on the uh, shock compressed layer of the uh, of the cloud, and which gives ample evidence to suggest that this cloud collision, this cluster formation was uh, induced by the cloud collision event. So this figure schematic here gives the uh, the sequence of events in the G133 complex, where the uh, this starts with the uh, two clouds uh, colliding with each other. And in the collision phase, we there is a shock compressed layer which forms, and the 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 multi-dimensional compression of the uh, shock compressed layer for results in the formation of uh, filaments and cores with the magnetic field direct amplified in the direction perpendicular to the filaments. And uh, we also see there's an over density of class one and class two ISOs along the intersection arc, which uh, advocates for the cloud collision induced cluster formation in the G133 complex. So this is about the uh, work that was uh, done. And as, as a future scope to this work, we, as like I said, in the recent literature, there were only like around uh, 50 uh, cloud pollution candidates where uh, high mass star formation is seen. So it is, there is a lack of statistical studies for uh, cloud pollution candidates and uh, a large scale observational database can be built to understand the general features of such systems, and that's a, that work is uh, in the pipeline for now. And uh, right now, what I'm doing is I'm, uh, I'm working on an IRA source, which is an older cloud calculation candidate, and it has a very complex morphology. And uh, so, the, the that work is going on uh, right now. So, that's about the talk today. Thank you. Any questions? Amita, you, you have completed your talk. Sorry? Yeah, you're done with your talk, okay. right? So yes, yes. Um, uh, may I ask participants if they have any questions, they can ask, uh, they can unmute and ask. Archana, please yeah, go ahead. Uh, nice and very concise talk, Amita. I liked it. Um, I, I, I have uh, I don't have questions. I just want a few clarifications. So okay. on your slide on your slide nine. Slide nine, okay. Yes. So these uh these contours are self contouring of uh, twelve CO. No, the color scale is thirteen twelve CO and the contours is thirteen CO. Okay. Okay. So and and okay, you have divided the the. Three components and velocities uh, from uh, minus five to twenty-five, and the intermediate and higher. Okay, so Correct. my point was: Did you try uh, making a one map with uh, different colors, like if one color showing one velocity range, other color mm -hmm. showing other velocity range, like this? Mm -hmm. And if you put everything together in one map, you will have an idea that where, where, which velocity structure is sitting in that map, and that will give more uh, idea on where the bridge is, where the uh, main cloud is and where the secondary cloud is. Did you do that? Yes, correct. I had done it, but I didn't do it for the three colors. I did it for two colors. Like here is the two color composite of uh, the 133A and this is 133B. Okay. Okay. And uh, I also assume that uh, yeah. hydrogen column density map was derived from your uh, CO, right? Correct. Yes. Using the standard. Uh, Standard yeah, this is the standard method. Conversion. Yes. Conversion. Yeah. Okay. One one point to mention here about the magnetic field. Okay. Okay. We have to be very careful about uh, reaching to any conclusions using the Planck data because if you see the length scale of your uh, of your filament, it's not that big, mm -hmm. and the Planck resolution is of the order of five arc minutes. So if you just uh, look at the Planck map, like three vectors in 15 arc minute, and if you say that, okay, everything looks like perpendicular, that's a little bit uh, uh, difficult to say because it's full of uncertainties and the, you'll get only one or three vectors in 15 arc minutes. So uh, for, for, getting to, uh, for getting on a very concise conclusion about the magnetic field morphologies in these regions, we have to have high resolution maps. So yes, uh, yes, I, think I for agree. Future studies, yeah. For future studies, you have to be very careful using a uh, plant yeah, method yeah. only to, to say something about magnetic field morphology. Yeah, so the thing yeah. is that we didn't have any magnetic field data with us, so only plant was available, and it was 
only just for the uh, confirmation purpose uh, because, because it has been seen in many many it has been seen in many many filaments that plank fields change their morphology quite a lot from a uh, plank scale mm -hmm. to to smaller scale you might have seen some maps so i'm certainly sure that the magnetic fields in in the filament itself is very complicated plank is not going to give us much information on that thank you okay okay thank you thank you Maina, can you please go ahead? Yes. Uh, nice talk, Namita. Um, I have two questions. So first one, I am against that in the excitation temperature map. So you mentioned that you derive it from 13 CO and 12 CO. Correct. So one thing is 12 CO will be probing much uh, less dense molecular region, right? And mm. on top of that, I was of the impression that the excitation temperature is essentially the depends on the population in different uh, energy levels of the same molecular complex. So, so I, I'm just trying to understand how uh, these two different species you are using to get the excitation temperature. Uh, yeah, so that so is this, my, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. that is my first question. And second okay. one, I'm not very familiar with the classification of YSO. So, so can you please tell me what is the difference between class one and class two YSO? Okay, yeah. So this is the uh, excitation, exc I mean, uh, determination of excitation temperature by this method is actually a very uh, standard method. So though they are two different species, it is the same transition. We use the one zero transition for this uh, estimation. And the uh, uh, so I can actually show you this paper where they give a nice uh, explanation of how this is done. Um, so, but this is a pretty standard method. Uh, All right, I, I can, I can. Uh, you please, you can please share it with me later. Okay. And about the YSO classification. Yeah. So. Yeah, so class one YSOs are like uh, young YSOs, which is still in the embedded phase. And class two YSOs are the, which has the, the, the en envelope has more or less gone and the only the circumstellar disk remains. These are called the, that is the uh, class two YSOs. Okay. All right. So, is, so you so are done this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the classification can be done with NIR data as well. And okay. But this we have used mid infrared data. Okay, okay, thank you. You were asking something else also. No, I was also thinking of so you are uh, connecting this to the to uh, massive star formation, um, predominantly based on the coincidence of YSOs at that uh, uh, location of the column density maps. Is it correct? Correct that and the uh, the. Um, uh, dust cores which we saw which has the potential to form high mass stars all right thank you uh any uh Fazlu, can you please uh yeah hello am i audible yes yes yeah. Yes. yeah uh yeah uh, it was very nice talk so i could not join in the initial part because my internet was not stable so i just wanted to ask a very naive question like somewhere i saw the spectral index beta in i mean i think it is in the slide of filaments and there so i just wanted to know like uh, what is the yeah. val typical value we use like i mean for our analysis i mean in general like for plank data and all it suggests beta around 1.5 and all but we know that it depends on like it's a spatially varying so what is the typical hmm. value we use in these cases i'm just curious so typically here we use around uh, two 1.8 to 2 is what we use but here i've used uh, two okay 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 yeah okay thank you thank you yeah I see anybody else I see no hands raising if anybody wants to ask questions or comments, please unmute yourself. Maybe one more quick question. Yeah, question. yeah, Archana, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Namita, do you have other data data sets uh, in this region other than uh, 12 CO and 13 CO and CAT now? Um, no, molecular line data, I couldn't find anything else. Okay. Okay, and did you uh, did you try uh, find uh, doing Gauss clump or core find like 
uh, packages on CAT low data because it is good doing cell worker on continuum emission, but it is also worth checking uh, these things on line emissions such as 13CO and CAT low. Uh, okay, I did not try for 13 CO, and the C18 O map was the signal to noise ratio was extremely poor, so I couldn't use C18 O. Uh, okay. Yeah, but 13 CO, I can try to use that uh, algorithm and see what, what, what was the, yeah, that can be what's the beam size of these uh, emissions from PMO. Uh, that is, uh, I think, around 38 arc seconds. So it's a okay. pretty poor resolution, but that was only available. So. Okay. okay. Yeah, Rajguru, please go ahead. Uh, hi, sorry, uh, just a gentle question. So you mentioned about direct collapse. Why is the direct collapse uh, uh, is not a viable one for uh, massive stars? Or did you say that or yeah, I mis misunderstood? Yeah, that is not a viable mechanism. It's like uh, morally, I mean, uh, it's not a viable mechanism because it would require very high protostellar densities. And that is not... Uh, often seen, so that is why it is more or less dismissed. Uh, theoretically, it is a viable mechanism, but uh, uh, practically, it is not much. That is the issue. We don't see it much uh, often. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I vaguely remember for uh, uh, generally for collapses of a large amount of gas, uh, the metallicity of the gas matters, isn't it? Or uh, does that play a role in any of your studies? Yeah, I've not considered the metallicity in any, any of the work. Mm. Uh, but uh, the other one is like uh, the like you said, it's not the collapse of the uh, gas. It is the uh, collapse of proto clusters. Like this, like the I'm sorry, the proto stars which merge into each other. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah. yeah. So the proto stars have to form by a low mass star formation mechanism and then merge into each other to form high mass star. All right, OK. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, Archana's hand is still raising. Do you want to ask more? Sorry. Okay. No, I'm sorry, that was old one. Okay, it's an old one. Um, if anybody else, we have some time. Okay, I I'll ask some general question. Um, um, you, you showed that uh, the morphology of these observations of the clouds, and it is very close to uh, the theoretical predictions. Uh, does the uh, observations uh, is depends on uh, the direction between the clouds and the uh, observer? Yes, it uh, depends, but in this case, it, it, I don't think it uh, matters because we can see a fairly good correlation between the two clouds. Yeah, I, yeah, it's good. It has a good correlation. For example, this cloud is in other direction. We won't, we can't able to match, is it? Yeah, but maybe we can see the kinematic signatures, but morphologically, maybe not that much. Oh, okay. So it depends on the direction, orientation. Yeah, of it the does, yes, it does depend on the orientation as well, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see no hands raising. So uh, let's thank uh, Namita for this wonderful talk. Thank you. And uh, yeah. See you in thank next you, Thank you everyone for listening. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you all for joining. <laughs>